This is part one of the video lecture on the English and Scottish Reformation. This lecture is for the Church History One class at the East Asia School of Theology. Like much of the rest of Europe, the Protestant Reformation in England and Scotland was a stormy affair and had profound consequences. The English and Scottish Reformation led to the birth of England, also known as the Anglican Church in England, and the Presbyterian Church in Scotland. It also opened the way for the rise of other Protestant denominations in later years. In this lecture, we'll look at the events of the English and Scottish Reformation of the 16th century. King Henry VIII's turbulent love life played a major role in the English Reformation. So this goes, this starts even before the English Reformation began because his father, King Henry VII, arranged for Catherine of Aragon to marry his oldest son, Arthur, okay? So King Henry VII arranged for Catherine of Aragon to marry Arthur, King Henry VII's oldest son. King Henry VII did this in order to secure an alliance with Spain, which was ruled at that time by King Ferdinand II. And yes, this Ferdinand II was the same king under which Christopher Columbus sailed to the New World. This marriage occurred in 1501 when Arthur was 14 years old. Unfortunately, Arthur died a year after their marriage, and so King Henry VIII, the seventh, I'm sorry, King Henry the seventh arranged for Arthur's brother Henry to marry Catherine. And this happened, and by 1509, Henry VIII had become King of England. Now, Henry VIII and Catherine had six children, all of whom were girls. Of these six children, only Mary survived infancy. And this caused problems for Henry VIII because he felt a strong need to father a son who would be able to inherit the throne after he died. King Henry VIII's solution for this problem was to divorce Catherine and marry another woman. Now, by this time, um, by the time King Henry VIII decided to do this, Catherine was over 40 years old, so it was unlikely that she would be able to give birth to another child. Now, according to Catholic teaching, divorces were absolutely not allowed. They were forbidden. However, the Catholic Church could annul a marriage, which meant they could declare that the marriage was null and void, but there had to be an acceptable reason for this to happen. King Henry VIII petitioned Pope Clement VII in 1527 for an annulment. And King Henry VIII's argument was that his marriage with Catherine should be annulled because she was originally married to his brother, Arthur. And the Old Testament prohibited marrying one brother. And the text that would be cited here is Leviticus 2021, 20, which in which God prohibits the Israelites, Israelites from marrying their brothers, Israelite men from marrying their brothers' wives. Ordinarily, the Pope would grant annulment to royal marriages when different kings asked for them. This was commonly done. However, Pope Clement VII wished to maintain good relations with 
King Charles V, who was the King of Spain as well as the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, making him the most powerful king in Europe. In addition, Catherine of Aragon was Charles V's aunt. So there was that family connection there. Furthermore, but there and, and there's more, because furthermore, Holy Roman Empire soldiers, these were soldiers under the command of Charles V. These soldiers sacked Rome in 1527. And after this sacking, Pope Clement VII always tried to pacify Charles V. He did not want to incur Charles V's anger. Still, Clement VII did not want to upset King Henry VIII either. So he did not want to upset either Charles V or Henry VIII. So Pope Clement VII kept delaying a decision on King Henry VIII's request for an annulment. Now, in the meantime, Henry VIII's affection had shifted to Anne Boleyn, a lady-in-waiting at the royal court. At first, Anne refused to sleep with King Henry VIII unless he married her. Henry VIII and Anne later began living together, but not sleeping together. Well, all of this changed sometime in December of 1532, when Anne changed her mind, slept with the king, and became pregnant. So now Anne Boleyn was pregnant, and Anne's pregnancy greatly increased Henry VIII's desire to get his first marriage annulled, and so he had to find some way. So what happened was this. In April 1533, the English Parliament passed the appeal statute, which forbade all appeals to the Pope in Rome on religious matters or any other matter. This was the beginning of the break with Rome. The following month, Thomas Cranmer, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, declared Catherine of Aragon's marriage to Henry VIII null and void. So King Henry VIII finally had his divorce. Then the Archbishop of Canterbury announced the marriage of Anne Boleyn to King Henry VIII just five days later. In September 1533, Anne gave birth to Elizabeth. In 1534, the British Parliament passed the Act of Supremacy, which declared King Henry VIII the head of the Church of England. And this was the act that, that finally ended, um, marked the real break between the Church of England and Rome. And even today, England's ruling monarch remains the head of the Anglican Church. And this means that King Charles III is both the head of the state and the head of the church in England. Now, so we have the Act of Supremacy, and this was the Act that made Henry VIII the head of the Church of England. Most unfortunately for Anne Boleyn, she remained King Henry VIII's wife for only three years. She behaved arrogantly, which caused her to become unpopular at the royal court. On May the 2nd, 1536, King Henry VIII sent Anne to the Tower of London on charges of adultery. 
she was she was tried by a court of her peers and found unanimously guilty. She was sentenced to death and was beheaded on May the 19th. It is very unlikely that Anne Boleyn was actually guilty of adultery. Only 11 days later, on May 30th, 1534, Henry VIII married his third wife, Jane Seymour. 17 months later, on October 24th, 1537, she gave birth to Edward, but she died of post-birth. Okay, so that's May 10th, May 30th, 1536. Henry VIII married his third wife, Jane Seymour. And 17 months later, on October 24th, 1537, she gave birth to Edward, but she died of post-birth complications just nine days later. Jane Seymour's death hit Henry VIII hard, and he did not remarry for three years. But when he finally decided to begin looking for a wife, um, he, he started looking for a new wife to marry, and this was in 1539. So he was sent a painting of Anne of Cleves from Germany. And when King Henry VIII saw this painting, which was this painting, he decided to marry her. Like his previous marriage, marriage to Catherine of Aragon, King Henry VIII wished to marry Anne of Cleves in order to secure an alliance. So it was not just romance that was involved. There were, there were political considerations involved in this um, marriage. Because King Henry VIII wanted to secure an alliance with Anne of Cleves' brother, William, who was a, duke, who was a Lutheran duke in the Holy Roman Empire. And so King Henry VIII thought that if he married Anne of Cleves, that this would help him to form an alliance with Duke William in the Holy Roman Empire, and that would help him to face the, the threat of possible war with France and Spain. So, the two... Um, King Henry VIII and Anne of Cleves were married on January the 6th, 1540, but rumors are that they never consummated their marriage because on their wedding night, Henry VIII decided that Anne was too ugly. And their marriage was annulled on July 12, 1540. Now, Anne of Cleves did not um, put up any objection to the annulment. And so because she did not put up any objection or make any fuss, King Henry VIII actually treated her very kindly after their annulment. So that was the end of King Henry VIII's fourth marriage. Now we move on to King Henry VIII's fifth wife, Catherine Howard. Catherine Howard began her time in the royal court as part of Anne of Cleves' household as a lady in waiting. She caught Henry VIII's eye and he quickly became interested in her. She also happened to be Anne Boleyn's cousin and it is likely that her uncle, the Duke of Norfolk, wished for her family to regain the influence they had enjoyed during the time that Anne Boleyn was married to the king. However, Catherine Howard um, was still a teenager. Uh, she married King Henry VIII on July 28, 1540, 
Um, so she was a teenager and King Henry VIII was 49 years old. Unfortunately, Catherine Howard had a history of sexual relations prior to marrying King Henry VIII. And she continued to flirt with men in the royal court, including Thomas Culpepper, who was one of King Henry VIII's favorites. In fact, Catherine may have done more than simply flirt with Thomas Culpepper. In addition, Catherine Howard had two, her two former lovers appointed to the royal court. And one of her former lovers, a man named Derham, started bragging to people at the court about his previous relationship with Catherine Howard. So this, so as you can imagine, the royal gossip machine was went into overdrive. And so royal gossip eventually led to Thomas, Thomas Cranmer relentlessly pursuing charges against Catherine. Catherine was stripped of her title as queen on November 23rd, 1541, and her two former lovers were both executed on December 10th, 1541. Catherine herself was executed on February 13th, 1542. And so now we come to King Henry VIII's sixth and final wife, Catherine Parr. King Henry VIII married Catherine Parr on July 12, 1543. Catherine Parr was twice widowed, and she proved to be a good influence upon King Henry during the final years of his life. She survived him when he died on January 28, 1547. And after King Henry VIII died, she married one more time, but died while giving childbirth. So one way to remember King Henry VIII's six marriages is the following uh, mnemonic or memory aid. Divorce, beheaded, die. Divorce, beheaded, survive. So Catherine of Aragon was divorced. Jane Seymour was beheaded. Um, no, Anne Boleyn was beheaded. Jane Seymour died. Catherine of Cleves was divorced. Catherine Howard was beheaded and Catherine Parr survived. So this is one way that you can remember King Henry VIII's six wives. So how all of this relates to church history is this. Because King Henry VIII wanted to have a male heir, he decided to divorce Catherine of Aragon. The Pope refused, the Pope kept delaying granting an annulment. And so King Henry VIII took matters into his old hand, own hands, cut, broke his ties with Rome, had his marriage with Catherine of Aragon annulled, and married Anne Boleyn. However, he kept going through five four more wives after Anne Boleyn in his quest for a son. Now he did have a son, Edward, and we'll hear, we will get to Edward um, in just a few moments. Now, before we get to King Edward, let's talk about the case of Sir Thomas More. During his attempt to divorce Catherine of Aragon, King Henry VIII was opposed by Thomas More, whom he had appointed as Lord Chancellor in 1529. This was a high government office, and uh, Thomas More had a long career of public service. 
Thomas More opposed the annulment of Henry VIII's marriage to Catherine of Aragon, and he resigned as Lord Chancellor in 1532. Thomas More enjoyed a quiet retirement until he refused to attend the coronation of Anne Boleyn in 1533. For this, he was tried before the Privy Council in February 1534. Thomas More was a popular public official, and so his popularity saved him at this time, and he was allowed to return home. However, the Act of Succession, which was passed in March 1534, sealed Thomas More's fate. This act required all those called upon to swear an oath recognizing Anne as Henry VIII's wife and as well as all their future children as legitimate heirs to the throne. Thomas More was willing to swear to this, but the act of succession also included a clause in, clause in the oath stating that he, that the person swearing this oath repudiated allegiance to any foreign authority, prince, or potentate. Thomas More could not affirm this second clause because he refused to recognize King Henry VIII as the head of the Church of England. Thomas More remained faithful in his allegiance to the Pope in Rome. And so, because of this, Thomas More was imprisoned in the Tower of London on April 17, 1534, and during his show trial, it was a show trial, he was found guilty of high treason. He was beheaded on July 6, 1535, and his final words before his death are right here on this slide. I die the king's faithful servant, but God's servant first. And even Protestants who disagreed with Thomas's, Thomas More's Catholic faith did not believe he was a traitor to the king. So once again, he had a death that was politically motivated. So Thomas More died a Catholic martyr, and he was later named a saint by the Catholic Church five, 400 years after his death in 1935. So now let's talk about the Church of England. Prior to breaking away from Rome, King Henry VIII was a very loyal Catholic. In fact, he wrote a treatise against Martin Luther's teaching, and for this, the Pope awarded him with the title Defender of the Faith. So, when the Act of Supremacy was enacted in 1534, very little actually changed in the Church of England, except that instead of the Pope being the head of the Church, King Henry VIII was now the head of the church. Henry VIII did order English Bibles to be placed in every local parish church. However, there was one major change that took place, and that was the confiscation of monasteries in England. By this time, the monasteries in England had accumulated a great deal of land and wealth. Henry VIII coveted this wealth, in part because he had already squandered much of, his, of the inheritance he had received from his father, King Henry VII. And so he ordered the confiscation of monasteries and nunneries throughout England. Between 1536 and 1540, every single monastery and nunnery, nearly 800 in all, were forcibly closed. 
As a result of the dissolution of these monasteries, Henry VIII came into the possession of large sums of money and vast amounts of land. He then sold the land to nobles and merchants who were loyal to him, thereby further cementing their loyalty to him. So this, this picture on the picture on this slide is of the remains of Pitchfield Abbey, which was given to one of Henry VIII's closest friends in 1537. After their monasteries were dissolved, most monks, friars, and nuns were given money or pension, but some abbots and leaders of monasteries and nunneries refused to comply with the dissolution of their, of their um, monasteries, and so they were executed. Thousands of monastic servants, okay, monastic servants. These would be ordinary people who work in monasteries. Um, they found them, suddenly found themselves without employment. Okay, so that's what happened with um, the, the monasteries and nunneries throughout England. They were all confiscated, dissolved, and closed down. Now, Let's talk about King Henry VIII's only son, Edward VI. Actually, his only legal son. Okay. Um, on January 28th, 1547, Henry VIII died, and his son became, and his son, Edward VI, became the new king. Edward VI was only nine years old at the time, so a council of regents was appointed to govern the kingdom until he became old enough to take up his royal responsibility. During Edward VI's reign, his regents continued to push forward the Protestant Reformation with great zeal. Edward VI himself was a devoted Protestant. However, Edward VI developed tuberculosis early in 1553, and he died in the summer of that year. So following King Henry VIII's death, a power struggle ensued, which included Lady Jane Grey's rule as queen for nine days. In the end, Henry VIII's daughter, by Catherine of Aragon, Mary became queen. Queen Mary was a staunch Catholic, and she, she tried to roll back all the reforms instituted by Henry VIII and Edward VI. During her reign, Protestants were persecuted, including 287 martyrs who were burned at the stake. Thousands of other Protestants fled the country to continental Europe. For this reason, Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary. Queen Mary also married Prince Philip of Spain, which raised fears that England would become part of the Spanish Empire and lose her sovereignty as an independent kingdom. However, Queen Mary's reign was short-lived, and she came to an end with her death in 1558. <clears throat> After Queen Mary died, Queen Elizabeth I, who was King Henry VIII's daughter by Anne Boleyn, became the new queen. Elizabeth I was a Protestant, but she tried to find a middle way in resolving England's religious question. She wanted to find a middle way because she wished to bring an end to the conflict between Protestants and Catholics within England and restore peace to the kingdom. These measures 
that were taken during Queen Elizabeth I's reign were collectively known as the Elizabethan Settlement. And so let's just look at some of these measures. The Act of Supremacy, which was passed in April 1559, restored the English monarch as the head of the Church of England. The Act of Uniformity in May of 1559 made church attendance in Anglican churches mandatory. This act was enforced by small fines for those who failed to attend. And these fines, in turn, <clears throat> were used to help the poor. On the other hand, attendance at Catholic churches were forbidden, and Catholic priests who were found to perform masses could face the death penalty. The Act of Uniformity also required worship in Anglican churches to be conducted according to the Book of Common Prayer. And uh, this Book of Common Prayer was an important document for the Anglican Church because it contained many prayers that, that were um, approved to be said during Anglican worship services. Then came the 39 Articles in 1571. These articles formed the Anglican Church's Statement of Beliefs. So you have the Nicene Creed, which all churches have um, throughout the world, but then the Church of England also has the 39 Articles, which is the statement of their beliefs. The Elizabethan settlement pleased most people in England, but not zealous Catholics who continued to practice their Catholic faith in secret, nor did it please zealous Protestants, including the Puritans, who felt that the Anglican Church was still too corrupted with Catholic teachings and practices. The, these Puritans would go on to have enormous influence in Britain and especially in America, but that is a story for another day. One remaining threat to Queen Elizabeth I's rule was the presence of Mary, Queen of Scots. Mary, Queen of Scots, was born the daughter of King James V of Scotland, who died a week before she was born. So when she was born, her father was already dead. She was originally supposed to marry Edward VI, King Henry VIII's son, but the Scottish lords opposed this union, so she instead went to France, where she married the Dauphin. Uh, the Dauphin was the heir apparent in France. That, that's the specific name for the crown prince in the French monarchy, the Dauphin. So Mary, Queen of Scots, married the Dauphin in 1548 in order to secure an alliance with France against England. So she married the Dauphin in order to form an alliance between Scotland and France against England. Unfortunately, the Dauphin died in 1561, and Mary, the Queen of Scots, reluctantly returned to Scotland. After returning to Scotland, Mary, Queen of Scots, fell deeply in love with Henry, Lord Darnley, but he proved to be a weak man, and Mary ended up ruling Scotland entirely alone. However, Lord Darnley and Mary, Queen of Scots, did give birth to James, who later became James, King James VI of Scotland, and then King James I of England. And that, too, is the story for another day, because King James I of England was the man who commissioned the King James Version of the Bible. 
Due to political infighting in Scotland, Mary, Queen of Scots, fled to England, where she was imprisoned by Queen Elizabeth I for 19 years. She was later found guilty of plotting to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I because what she had been doing, what Mary, Queen of Scots, had been doing was she had been sending secret messages to other Catholics in England. And these messages were written in code. And so some of the code breakers in Queen Elizabeth uh, the first government were able to crack these codes and they deciphered them and proved that Mary, Queen of Scots, had been plotting with Catholics in England to overthrow Queen Elizabeth I and place and return England to Catholic rule. And so Mary, Queen of Scots, was found guilty of treason, and she was beheaded on February the 8th, 1587. Men now, here's another interesting thing. Mary, Queen of Scots' death led directly to the Spanish Armada, which set sail in 1588 to invade England, but was decisively defeated by the British Navy in the English Channel. So, this is the story of the English Reformation. And so, by the time um, of the Spanish Armada, England had become more or less Protestant under the Church of England. So now we will end this first part, the first part of this lecture, and we will go to part two. So please look for part two of this lecture.